Hello friends, my name is JJ. So check out this cheapo bag of gummy worms I bought at the dollar store the other day. I purposely tried to get the cheapest version of the most generic American candy I could think of because I wanted to make a point about flavors. Gummy worms obviously tend to be fruit flavored and since these ones are so cheap, they've only got four flavors. And can you guess the four? What four tried and true fruit flavors would a lazy American candy company be most likely to default to? The answer in this case was lemon, orange, lime, and uh, red, which is either cherry or strawberry, but honestly, these candies are so cheaply made, it's kind of hard to tell. But it doesn't matter because in any case, I would say some combination of these fruits represent the holy quintet of American fruit flavored candies. I mean, sure, these days you can buy Kiwi Skittles and Guava Sour Patch Kids and all the rest of it, but these five flavors are almost always the default starting position. If a candy is cheap and unambitious, like gummy worms or jujubes or dots or lifesavers, it almost always uses the big five. While it's generally the more expensive and creative candies that either build on or replace this flavor foundation. Anyway, I was thinking of how we got to the point where lemon, orange, lime, cherry, and or strawberry became our default understanding of what fruit flavors are. Why is it bees and I don't know, not blackberry, peach, cantaloupe, and mango? This is the kind of question I find most fascinating because I like forcing myself to think about things that I take for granted as normal. After all, it is the things we take for granted that are often the purest manifestation of our culture. After all, what is culture if not the stuff around us that is too common to contemplate? So the story of how the big five fruity flavors achieved their current position of prestige in American candy culture is an interesting one because it's quite inseparable from the larger story of the growth of both candy and fruit as staple parts of the American diet. A lot of people don't realize this, but eating fruit and candy are actually surprisingly recent additions to American culture and have only really been mainstream for less than 150 years. The TLDR version of the story is basically that when fruit flavored candies first started to become a thing, the candy makers gave them the flavors of the fruits that Americans of the time would have been most into, and the fruits Americans would have been most into were themselves quite recent novelties. In other words, American fruit and candy culture have always been locked into a sort of symbiotic relationship, one that I would argue continues to this day. So candy is a mass-produced industrialized product, and as such, it didn't really exist before the industrial revolution of the mid 19th century. We humans have always liked eating sugary foods, but for a long time, sugar was quite expensive because the process of refining sugar was very time consuming. So eating food with a lot of sugar was reserved for special occasions. This is where the whole tradition of only eating cake on your birthday or at your wedding or whatever comes from. Sugar did become much more common in the early 1800s due to the growth of European sugar colonies and frankly, the American slave economy. But even then, according to this excellent essay by Dr. Stephen Goynet, in the year 1820, your average American still only consumed about this much sugar, about six pounds in an entire year. Today, we eat about 25 of these. If poor or middle-class Americans wanted sweets in the old days, the best they could get were things made of like molasses or honey. Even nuts were often considered sweets back then, just because in a world where sugar was less common, sweet obviously became a much more relative term. I was surprised to learn that even sugar plums, perhaps the most iconic sweet of the early 1800s, aren't at all what they sound like. I always imagined them as like plums covered in sugar or something, but in reality, they were just little balls of ground up seeds and figs with maybe a tiny pinch of sugar. Yes, in those pre-candy times, seed balls were considered so thrilling, kids were assumed to be dreaming about them on Christmas Eve and they even got a whole song in the Nutcracker. But all that changed once the era of machines dawned. The steam powered factories that emerged during the industrial revolution of the mid 19th century made refining sugar a vastly quicker and easier process, which in turn dramatically increased the amount of refined sugar that was available. The machines also allowed us to create exciting new products like glucose or corn syrup, 
which became a cheaper substitute for real sugar that's still widely used in all sorts of food products to this day. And thus, in a relatively short period of time, an abundance of sugar and machines allowed a powerful new American candy industry to be born. Assembly lines could create perfect little boxes and bags of thousands of identically shaped individual blobs of sugar and gelatin that would soon become a staple of the American diet, no longer just on Christmas morning, but at the movies, at grandma's house, even at the doctor's office. According to this book, Candy, a century of panic and pleasure. In 1850, the US candy industry was worth just $3 million, but by the year 1900, it had ballooned to 60 million, and then a billion by the end of World War II. But what should all of these new candies taste like? In the early days, the most popular flavor of sweets, if not just sugar flavor, were generally spices, since those were the sort of tastes 19th century Americans were most familiar with. So you got candy flavors like cinnamon and mint and cloves, even weird flower tastes like rose or lilac. But these spice flavor candies didn't last long and were quickly displaced by new, more exciting flavors that had arisen out of the other big food culture shakeup that America was experiencing around the same time. The Fruit Revolution. Fruits obviously existed in America before the mid 19th century, but like sweets, they were often quite rare and lame. A big part of this had to do with the fact that for a long time, the most populated parts of America were all relatively cold and not good for growing fruits beyond maybe a few small and bitter types of berry or this gross type of apple. The Southerners, meanwhile, were only interested in using their farmland and slave labor to grow cotton and eventually our old pal sugar but not much else. The other thing was that people in the old days were just a lot more broadly ignorant about the basic science of horticulture and botany and all that. When farmers tried to grow edible plants, they generally just put up with however they grew. And if that meant small or sour fruits, people just assumed that was all the plants were capable of. All that changed in the mid 19th century when pioneering researchers like Liberty Hyde Bailey, the father of American horticulture, led the movement to study plant growing and plant genetics as a serious science, and then share that information with farmers through new government agencies like the Department of Agriculture. Take strawberries, for instance. They're native to North America, but for a long time, people only knew them as these small and shrimpy things. Then the pioneering horticulturalist James Wilson came along and bred a new version in 1858. And in doing so, according to this comprehensive history of strawberries, Wilson single-handedly changed the strawberry from a fruit grown for the few by the few into a fruit grown by hundreds of thousands from Florida to Maine and west to California and Washington. Cherries were a similar story. They were brought to North America by the Dutch in the 1600s, but the big juicy sweet cherries of the sort we love today didn't become common until at least the 1850s. The state of Michigan likes to give one of their residents, the Reverend Peter Doherty, credit for helping set up what would become the first commercially successful cherry orchard in 1893. Michigan cherries would become a hot item in the early 20th century ice cream and liquor scene, thanks to these things, maraschino cherries, which although not an American invention, became very popular in the States thanks to a newfound abundance of both cherries and sugar. Citrus fruits, meanwhile, were brought to the New World by the Spanish and Portuguese, where they grew well in the warm southern colonies of those countries. Limes grew particularly well in Mexico, and accordingly, Mexican cuisine has always used a lot of lime in their food and drinks. Then, in 1846, the US conquered a big chunk of Mexico, and with it, a lot of people with a taste for limes. For a while, limes were the most widely grown fruit in America's newly acquired state of California. California oranges, meanwhile, are something the US Department of Agriculture likes to take credit for creating. As more American farmers flowed into the former Mexican territory, they needed ideas for something to grow in this unusually warm climate. Drawing upon their newfound reserves of plant science, the federal government recommended navel oranges, and the idea proved a huge success. They grew like crazy and triggered what became known as the California orange boom, which lasted from the 1880s to the 1950s or so. What was significant was that this orange boom occurred at the same time that trains, and especially refrigerated train cars, 
were becoming a thing. This meant that not only could the Californians grow oranges, they could also export them to the other end of the country without them rotting along the way, and Easterners could not get enough of them. Oranges used to be seen as this super exotic fruit from Spain that ordinary people would never encounter, so buying a big box of California oranges with the beautiful label on the side became a real symbol of affordable middle-class luxury. In fact, according to this book, Citrus a History by Pierre Laszlo, the growth of LA as one of America's major cities was largely fueled by the sale of oranges to an avid Eastern market. As I'm sure you know, oranges also played a big role in the growth of Florida, which was of course another former Spanish colony with a warm climate that proved very hospitable to citrus growing. In fact, a lot of the history of American fruit in the late 19th century is just a tug of war between Florida and California over who would emerge king of the oranges. The California lemon boom came a bit later and was another example of a crop that only thrived once farmers became more savvy to the science of fruit growing. Lemons used to be a fairly upscale thing that Americans on the East Coast would import from Italy. People would mix lemon juice with honey or molasses or good old sugar and make an exciting new drink called lemonade. Once the US lemon supply increased, lemonade became a real trendy thing for Americans of all classes and gained particular popularity once alcohol started to get banned. The popularity of lemonade is probably also the reason reason why America's two oldest and most popular soft drinks, 7-Up and, believe it or not, Coca-Cola, are primarily lemon flavored. Lemon is also the oldest fruit flavor that has been used in American candy, with hard lemon drops probably among the oldest continuously eaten American sweets. Anyway, by the dawn of the 20th century, the massive growth of fruit as a standard part of the American diet, particularly the newfound popularity of citrus fruits, strawberries, and cherries, had big consequences for America's equally fast-growing candy industry. Candy companies found that Americans increasingly didn't want candies flavored like boring old cloves or turmeric or whatever. They wanted candies that tasted like these new exciting fruits that they had increasingly grown up eating and drinking. In 1901, the newly established New England Confectionery Company released their nine flavored Necco wafers, which are often recognized as the first American candy to add the idea of multiple fruit flavors to their lineup with lemon, lime, and orange alongside cinnamon and chocolate and mint. A soft candy known as Juji Fruits was released by the Hyde Corporation in the year 1920, and they too quickly phased out their herb and spice flavors for a new lineup of lemon, cherry, lime, and orange. They kept their black aniseed flavor, however, which was still popular. These days, people don't know what aniseed is, so candy companies market it as licorice flavor, even though licorice doesn't actually taste like aniseed. And from basically that point on, a new American fruit flavor canon had emerged. As the concept of multi-flavored candies became more popular in the early 20th century, all of America's now over 1,000 candy brands, including Chuckles, Lifesavers, Curtis Fruit Drops, Mike and Ike, Dots, and of course, Jelly Beans, started embracing some version of the now standard red, yellow, orange, green flavor lineup. Oh sure, there would be variations here and there. Apples had obviously been an iconic American fruit for a long time, so it was not uncommon to see attempts said apple-flavored candies, and other good, but perhaps somewhat less common American fruits like grapes, watermelon, raspberries, blueberry, and even pineapple would make strong efforts to weasel their way into the big five in later decades. But it is remarkable how stable and continuously well-loved by Americans this standard lineup has remained for at least a hundred years. Even lime, which I personally find the grossest of the big five, has surprisingly ardent defenders. The Skittles people faced a big backlash a few years ago when they tried to phase out the flavor. Today, America's domestic fruit industry has withered considerably, with the march of technology and trade now making it cheaper and easier to just import foreign fruits rather than grow them on U.S. soil. But even something as modest as this dollar store bag of gummy worms remains a lasting monument to a surprisingly deep chapter of American food history. Which of the big five is your favorite? And do you think there's another American fruit that by now has earned a spot in the top tier? And if you're not from America, do you think that there is a popular candy fruit flavor in your country that Americans should know about? Let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.